Uh, you notice our background is a little bit different this morning. If you've joined us in the past or if you're part of our Cross and Crown family, we're still in our church building. But around us, as we gather for worship, are a number of beautiful stained glass windows that tell the story of Christ's life. And to give a, a little different perspective, but also make use of one of these beautiful works of art, which the previous pastor, Pastor Eric Hartzell, both designed and fashioned, and fill the, the worship space. Uh, we've chosen to, to do today's service with the backdrop of our Palm Sunday window, where we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem, because today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of what we know as Holy Week, a very important week in the life of Christ, but most importantly, a, life, a week in his life that is also an important week uh, for each one of us. So I'd like to read to you Matthew's account of the events of Palm Sunday and with this in the backdrop um, for our service today, just to, to have a, a little bit of connection uh, with those crowds and those shouts and what Jesus did as he rode into Jerusalem. So Matthew chapter 21, the gospel records this. As they, that is Jesus and his disciples, approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now we're going to touch on what we just read from Matthew chapter 21, as well as some verses from the beginning of John chapter 13. So if you'd like to grab your Bible or find on your device those verses, you can follow along as well. Because as, as we put ourselves in in that setting of Palm Sunday, and either as one of the disciples or as one of the crowd that is shouting praises, recognizing that this is one who comes in the name of the Lord and is one who, who comes in the line of King David, that there was a, a buzz around in the city of Jerusalem because there were many who thought in regard to this Messiah that this person had the power to come in and kick out the Romans and establish this earthly kingdom that then would reestablish the nation of Israel and the people of Israel and would have a prominence and a notoriety like they had back under the rule of King David and King Solomon. This idea of an earthly kingdom was one that certainly was circulating around the followers of Jesus even and even some of the disciples. And so th this was an exciting day when they saw Jesus riding into, into town and they, they heard these rumors and they go, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the guy that has the power to do this, to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. Before we go much farther, let me ask you a question. Jesus did have the power to do that. In fact, he was God. He had all power. But if, if you had the power to do anything, what would you choose to do? You know, perhaps we think of a superhero that has power to, 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 to run fast or has incredible strength or has the ability to have x-ray vision and has the ability to swoop in exactly when it's right time to, to save an individual or save a community from evil. And maybe as we think about our communities and our country, if, if, if we had all the power in the world, what would we do with it? Perhaps what is immediately in our minds, I, I cure this 
coronavirus, I, 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 we'd, we'd get rid of it and we'd, we'd cure those that have it. And, you know, if I had the power, those that have died from it, maybe I even consider bringing them back to life to enjoy a few more days on this, on this earth. If we had the power, uh, perhaps we'd think about restoring our economy and getting businesses back to work and getting people back to work and the jobs that they had just four or five weeks ago. Perhaps if we, if we think of the, the, the power to do something, we'd not just do that for our community, but for our country and, and for the world as a whole. And, and certainly we'd, we'd, be, we'd be hailed as a superhero, as one who had, had cured this illness and had restored society back to some of its normalcy. And maybe the, maybe the kids who are out of school, maybe by this time they're getting ready to go back, but maybe they wouldn't be as, as excited as some of the rest of us. But power is an incredible thing. And to ask, what would I do with that power if I had it, is perhaps a, a sobering question. Now, it's interesting in, in John's gospel, the, the verse I'm going to start with is verse 3 in John chapter 13. Now, John chapter 13 starts the beginning of John's record of these final hours of Jesus' life. And that, that runs through the rest of his, his gospel through the resurrection. In John chapter 13, verse 3, it says this, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and, God, that, that he had come from God and was returning to God. You know what I pictured when I read this was, if the Father is the pilot and Jesus is the co-pilot, it's as if the Father backs up from his seat and says, all right, son, take the reins, take the controls. You got the power to take this wherever you'd like. And Jesus certainly was the Son of God, but as he lived on this earth, he, he set aside the full use of his divine attributes, even though he remained fully God. And, and he had this power, but John makes the specific point that the Father had put everything under his power. Now, if you <clears throat> were Jesus and you knew it was coming up, and you knew that you had to go to the cross, and you knew that you were going to be scourged and beaten and spit upon and ridiculed, betrayed by a friend, and if you had the power perhaps you'd be tempted to say, forget it. I'm walking away from this. This isn't going to be any fun. It's not going to do me any good. And in fact, um, no, I, if you're giving me the power, Father, I'm walking away. We, we know he doesn't do that. And what Jesus chooses to do with the power that he had perhaps is very surprising, also very humbling. John's account continues in verse 4. So he had, was given this assurance that all power was his. So Jesus gets up from the meal. This is the Passover meal the disciples were gathered to, to, to partake of. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him not just taking on the nature of a servant, but actually serving. With all the power that Jesus had, Jesus chose to serve. With all the power that he had, Jesus chose to serve. Now, that's very different than perhaps the natural mind thinks, that if my, my natural mind thinks, if I have the power to do this, it's more natural to think of what can I do for myself with that power. In, earlier in, in Jesus' ministry, his disciples had come to him, especially James and John, and perhaps this is why it just sticks out in John's memory and the Spirit allows him to record this particular message in John 13 because he and his brother James and their mother came to, to Jesus and said, if you're going to reestablish this kingdom, Jesus, if you're going to have the power in Israel to be ruler over Israel, um, before anyone else claims this, we'd like to have a position of power on your right and on your left. And Jesus takes that opportunity to teach James and John and the rest of the disciples that life in his kingdom was not about using power for their own selfish interest. But rather he teaches this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He says this to James and John and the rest of the disciples, to you and to me as well. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is prior to the week that we're on. But Jesus says, even the Son of Man, who had every right 
to have all the power and to lord it over and to, to demand peoples to serve him. He rather chooses to use that power to serve others to the point that he allows himself to die on the cross. Here's the first point, main point that we learn about Jesus, and we're going to expand on it in the verses that follow. True service is driven by love, not obligation. True service is driven by love, not obligation. For Jesus takes up this towel and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now, why would he do that? The first verse and second verse of John chapter 13 give us the heart behind Jesus' activity. It says this, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. It wasn't that Jesus had not been loving before the event of Palm Sunday. It was about this, this whole process from his birth through his life and his teaching and ministry and healing. Yes to Palm Sunday, his ride into Jerusalem, to the upper room, to the cross, and yes to the empty tomb. He had one thing in mind, and that was to show his love. Now, when you think about some of the events of, of Holy Week, that as he rode into Jerusalem, there were those that, that stood off to the side and said, you know, tell these people to be quiet, tell the children to, to, to be quiet, that they didn't think he deserved that recognition and that praise, but yet he still loved them. Or as he sits around that table in the upper room, as he'll point out in just a moment, one of his friends is going to betray him, but he still loved him. When they were in the garden, Peter took out his sword and cut off the servant's of the high priest's ear, and, and Jesus took it up and healed the very one who was there to arrest him. Or those that, that spit on him, mocked, on, mocked him, scourged him, and eventually hung him on the cross, one of the first things he says while hanging suspended above the earth was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. As his mother Mary, who had been a, a faithful mother, stood there at the foot of the cross, grieving the crucifixion of her son, he reaches out to John and says, John, take care of mom. And mom, here's your son. He's going to take care of you. In the midst of a time where he could have been focused on himself, he focuses on others. Because he wants to show them, and through it to show each one of us, the full extent of, of his love. And see, that's what this week is all about. And I pray we don't miss it amidst the, the news reports. And, and it's interesting because I, I caught a little bit of President Trump's update yesterday afternoon. He says, the American people need to prepare for a rough week. In fact, a rough couple of weeks. As this virus uh, perhaps hits with a vengeance and lives are lost as a result of it, I, I certainly pray and I invite all of us to pray for God's mercy that he would curtail the impact of this virus. But he has, he has a purpose and he has a, a reason for it, and we trust that that is good and that is loving. But it's perhaps ironic in the midst of a period in our country's history where our president says, prepare for death, that I'm sure he, he lies awake thinking, I wish I had the power to stop this. Perhaps I have a bit of power to curtail it or slow it down, but he doesn't have the power to stop it that in the midst of this, we have Holy Week, that Jesus knew on Friday was going to involve death. <laughs> Not just a nice death, but death on a cross. And he had the power to step away from it. He had the power to stop it, but he didn't. Because he knew that what you and I needed, especially this week, was the full extent of his love to take care of the virus that affects each one of us and that of sin and the wrath of a perfect God that has every right to punish sin. And he was willing to ride into Jerusalem and take on the task of paying for your sins and mine and the punishment that it deserved. Why? Not because he was obligated, but because he truly loves you. He truly loves me, which led him to serve us. True service 
is driven by love, not obligation. So Jesus is washing his disciples' feet, and he's going around the table, and he comes to Peter. And, and this is uh, his interaction with Peter, and I, and I love Peter because he says things perhaps you and I think at times, but we probably would be too chicken to speak up out loud. And Peter does that again, and Jesus uses an opportunity to teach Peter and to teach you and me a lesson as well. Here's what happens. Verses 6 to 11, Jesus came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not everyone was clean. It's interesting that when Jesus gets around to Peter, Peter says, no, Lord, don't wash my feet. Now, I, can, I, I don't know exactly what was going through Peter's mind and his heart, trying to understand what Jesus was doing, and Jesus acknowledges that. He goes, Peter, I get it. You don't understand what this is all about right now, but later you will. But I ask myself the question, what might have been the reasons that Peter said, Jesus, don't, don't wash my feet? And then after Jesus insists, he said, well, then wash my, my head and my hands as well. What would lead us to push away Jesus' service to us, his love for us? Perhaps just spontaneously like Peter did or perhaps permanently like Judas did. What would lead us to push aside the loving service that Jesus has done for us? I can think of two, I'm sure there are more, but Maybe these two are behind those moments in life where we, in essence, say, Jesus, I, I don't want your loving service. I don't need what you have to offer. I think the biggest one is our own pride and our own ego that says, I, I got this. I can handle this on my own. Well, Jesus, if you could just be on the sidelines, in case I need you, I, I, I need you to be there at beck and call as soon as I need it, as soon as I request it. If, if I ask for it, I need you to be there. But until that point, I think I got this. And especially when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to our relationship with our Heavenly Father, our perfect Heavenly Father, that inside we can crop up inside and say, you know what, I've, I've been living a, a pretty good life and I've, I've done a lot of good things and, and I think I'm better than most. And so Jesus, I, I think there are other people who need you a bit more than I need you. I think there are people out there that are worse sinners than I am. So if you need to focus your attention somewhere, I think I'm pretty good, and you can, you can take your work elsewhere. I think that can subtly crop up inside each of us that we feel like we got this thing with our Savior Jesus, and we don't need His loving service. Perhaps another way that our ego shows up in, in regard to that, that, that life has many other activities and many other interests and many other belief systems and say, you know what, I, I'll, I'll figure this on my own, and I'll keep, I'll keep Jesus, I'll keep you as an option that I may come back to, but you know, right now, I, I think I'm, you know, life is, is going pretty well and, and going pretty good, and I, I don't need you. So pride can sometimes push away Jesus' loving service, either in a moment or for a longer period of time. Perhaps another thing that can push away Jesus' loving service is what I would call a false humility. And, and the way that that shows up at times is I begin to almost despair of my sin and I begin to think, I've done too much. If Jesus would only know all I've thought and all I've said, I'd, I don't think he would forgive me. And in essence, we're saying, Jesus, I don't think what you did, while I believe you did it for the world, I don't think you did it for me. And so we say, Jesus... I, 
I, I, I think you can pass by. I don't deserve your feet washing. I don't deserve your loving service. To, to both of those and perhaps other iterations of that, Jesus comes and says, no, you, I, I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to show you my love because true service is true love. Not an emotional, not just a friendship love, but that love that is willing to serve on behalf of another. And Jesus says to Peter, your inside is clean. Jesus could see Peter's heart, and he knew that this was just a moment of weakness. It wasn't a rejection of who Jesus was. And Jesus acknowledges, Peter, the inside is clean. I don't need to wash your hands and wash your head because your, your heart is clean. But I am going to serve you by washing your feet. And then he points out Judas, the one whose heart Satan had taken over and hardened against the loving service that Jesus had had come to give. So as we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem and as we journey with him through this holy week, it isn't a time, it is a time to also repent of our arrogance and ego, of our false humility that says, Jesus, I, I don't need you, but rather in humble repentance to come before Jesus and say, I need you. And perhaps in our country, in our culture, in our communities, in our families, in our homes, in our own hearts, we need that more than ever. We need the assurance that Jesus came to serve us by loving us or loving us by serving us, however you want to put it. And that this week, don't miss the journey with your Savior from the shouts of Hosanna at Palm Sunday to the cries of crucify him on Good Friday to the shouts of he is risen on Easter Sunday. It's going to be a, an, an amazing and a wonderful week for your faith. Jesus showed this love, but he didn't want it to just stop with him showing love to his disciples. The account goes on, and John records Jesus' teaching to show to us true love is characterized by service, not selfishness. True love is characterized by service, not selfishness. John chapter 13, verse 12 says this, when Jesus had finished washing their feet. He put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus showed his love to you. He served you so that you can have true peace and hope in your heart that when your life on this earth ends, you will spend an eternity with him in heaven. That was Jesus' heart and his desire for you. But while we're still on this earth, Jesus teaches his disciples that the love that he has shown to them, he wants to spill over in our love for others. To take what we have learned from Jesus' self-sacrificing love and show that same self-sacrificing love to others. True love is characterized by service, not selfishness. Now, how does that perhaps show up in, in this time in our lives, in this season of our lives? I invite you to consider that, and if you have a great idea, uh, share it in the, in the comments on Facebook of, of an idea of, of ways to serve, because it perhaps is different than it was just maybe a, a few weeks ago or a couple months ago. But here's a few that came to my mind, and, and like I said, please add to them in the, the comments under the Facebook stream. In this time of isolation, perhaps it's an opportunity to use the phone portion of your device and call up someone that you haven't talked to in a while, that you maybe normally have interaction with, that you have a personal connection with. Maybe it's someone that you regularly saw on a Sunday morning at church, whether here at Cross and Crown or your home church. You say, you know what? I, I miss seeing them on a Sunday morning. And perhaps after today's service, you can pick up the phone and give them a call. And as if you join them for worship 
on a Sunday morning. Let someone know they're being thought of, being, being cared about. Perhaps it's uh, writing a handwritten note, making a card and, and putting it in the mail and sending it to someone so they can be surprised that there's, there's actually a personal piece of mail in, your, in their mailbox. Perhaps you know a student maybe uh, that is, is struggling to kind of get this online learning thing and that you know that they're a classmate and you can reach out to them and, and help them through their homework. Perhaps you're a parent who is, is, is getting this online learning and is, is figuring it out with your kids, and maybe you know a fellow mom or dad who's just kind of struggling to get into a routine and juggle their, their work and their home and getting this learning into their kids as well. Perhaps it's an opportunity to reach out and say, how can I help? Perhaps it's uh, someone who's been laid off or furloughed from their work that you know, that maybe ordering them a meal and having it delivered if it's safe and allowable in your community. Just say, hey, I know times are tough. We're thinking of you and praying for you. Enjoy a meal. Perhaps it's someone you know that's uh, suffering from this virus that is maybe at home in isolation, in quarantine, maybe in a hospital. And I know it's very difficult to visit those that have this disease even family members. But perhaps there's a way to, to get a note, to get a message, either, again, through your phone or texting, um, an online chat, some way to let them know that you care, that Jesus cares. Perhaps just asking the Lord to show you a way to add value to others. Maybe it shows up in your own home that uh, patience is running thin a little bit, and a way to serve is taking a deep breath, asking the Lord for strength, and creating a, a memory, creating lemonade out of perhaps the lemons you feel like you've been dealt. I'm sure there are many more ideas and many more things that we can do to serve one another and take the love that Jesus showed us this Holy Week and let it spread in the world around us. You know, someone put a, a, a neat quote that stuck with me in regard to the church, that we feel like the, the church is shut down and we can't worship and we can't get together. Yes, those things are true, but the phrase was, the church isn't closed, the church is deployed. And I believe God is deploying us in, in this unique time to, to bring His hope, to bring His peace, to bring His love, to bring His forgiveness, to bring His service in whatever way we can to the people around us. And Jesus says, as you do this, you will be blessed. It's interesting in teaching that Jesus gave on Monday and Tuesday of Holy Week, he talks about the end times, and he talks about what it's going to be like when Jesus does return and, and to take us to be with him, reunite our souls and our bodies in, in that glorious day. And he says this in Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 40, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That Jesus knows that as we show love to others, it's like we're doing it to him. And it's not that we have a little tally book and keeping track. We're just letting the love of Jesus and his service for us sink in and fill our hearts and lives so that as we serve others, it simply flows from the love that Jesus showed to us. True service is motivated by love, not obligation. And true love is characterized by service, not selfishness. And throughout this week, while it may be a tough week for you personally, as a family, as a community, as a country, it was a tough week for our Savior. And the reason that he went through it was to show his love for you, to give you hope in difficult and trying days and to give you a vision of the future of what it looks like as we spend an eternity with him he did do it all for you from the shouts of hosanna to the shouts of crucify him to the shouts of he is risen i pray that jesus love for you his service for you will sink in deeply this week and pour out from you as you serve one another. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world. He knew it was going to be a tough 
life to live, especially a tough week. He had all power to walk away, yet he chose to continue the path to the cross because he loved and still does love each one of us. Lord, bless our journey through this holy week. Let it be one that renews and refreshes, that drives out all fear and replaces it with peace, that moves away hopelessness and restores it with hope. The uncertainty with certainty. The feeling of aloneness with your presence. Lord, we ask you to show up in the hearts and lives of those around our country, around our communities, around our families and friends. Let them be filled with your love for them, seeing that all that you did for them was not out of obligation or selfishness, but simply because you loved us and you came to serve us. In Jesus' name, amen.